yeah, yeah. Hi, Muli. Thanks for for joining in. Yeah. It's seven thirty. We will start at seven thirty-one. Thank you. So I, I'm glad uh, Mridula as well has uh, has joined. Hello, Mridula. Okay, we are live. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining our program. It's 7.30. We will start at 7.31. Thank you. Yes, sorry about that. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us on this lovely evening today. Um, we are very thrilled to host this uh, National Science Day program for you. And we put together a couple of things. And I request our president of the IIT Madras Alumni Association, uh, Mr. Krishnan Narayanan, to please give the welcome address and take it forward. Over to you, Krishnan. Thanks, uh, thanks, Nishani, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, this special program on the uh, the National Science Day, which is which is the day where we are celebrating the discovery of the Raman effect. Uh, you know, on twenty eighth February, nineteen twenty eight. So, uh, you know, it's an, it's an exciting day for us that we're looking forward to, and uh, this year the theme that has been chosen is uh, global science for global well-being. And uh, uh, of course, this is, this, uh, this is a very, very important topic uh, at a very important time. So we will learn more about it. Now, I just wanted to take one minute to tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, why IIT Madras Alumni Association, you know, what, sort of what, what we've been doing on the Thought Le Leadership Initiative front. In fact, over the last four or five years, uh, we have taken a number of initiatives. In fact, our Guru Talk series is quite popular on YouTube. We started something called the Engineering Explained series. Our uh, flagship event called Sangam, annual event there, we have an opportunity to, to explore one theme every year. And uh, last year, I'm happy to say that we had put together a, a thought leadership uh, council uh, of 12 alumni you know, of, uh, of IIT Madras. In fact, if I can ask the team to project that, that one slide of the, you know, the, the TLC. Yes. Yeah. So uh, these are the people who are part of the TLC. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know who are all there, but I do know Mr. Nair, uh, Mridula, Murli are here on the call today. Uh, of course, I'm very delighted that uh, these people have given their time through the year last year, uh, every month, was very exciting time where we get to hear some some very very exciting ideas from from each one of them. Uh, we've also, as a thought leader council, put together some thought processes on something called an India Arise program, which you will hear shortly. <clears throat> I think we can remove this uh, slide for now. So, uh, uh, basically, on this occasion of uh, National Science Day, I had requested each of the uh, the thought leaders to to write one one page each on this theme, and I'm happy to say that uh, the team has put together a nice report on it. Uh, so at this time, I would like to just uh, take this opportunity to release the release the report. Uh, you know, I would like to be basically be joined by the other uh, uh, TLC members uh, here, and on, on on all their behalf, I'm very happy to. To, to launch this report. Yeah, uh, this will be available post this call for you to download and, and see. Yeah. Right. Very good. So that was, uh, that was one. And on behalf of the, uh, uh, you know, IIT Madras Alumni Association, behalf of, behalf of the Thought Leadership Council, we have another very exciting event today, uh, which is where we have Professor Pradeep, T. Pradeep, uh, you know, very celebrated uh, professor at, at, at IIT Madras who, who, who has kindly agreed to join us today. Now, 
uh, and and he will be delivering our lecture for this uh, for this evening now we've had i've had the opportunity of interacting with professor pradeep over uh, over a number of years you know many many years back i i ran a water startup where i had a first opportunity to interact very closely with him and at that time itself i got to got to know about some of the exciting work uh, he's been doing in fact about 2 3 years back through the iit ma we embarked on a, a very important project under his, under his leadership where we are writing a book uh, called empowering india ideas for action by scientists and engineers and that gave me another uh, opportunity to interact even more closely and uh, and uh, learn from him of course there are many many awards that he has uh, uh, professor pradeep has got gotten for the for the extraordinary work that he has done uh, i know this year itself he won the prince, prince uh, sultan bin abdul aziz international prize award i mean 2022 uh, you know we just finished celebrating it and then he he won the the next prize uh, from vietnam and uh, uh, you know we we finished celebrating and guess what he is he is getting feted with another award tomorrow literally tomorrow <laughs> so uh so it's 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 uh, it's amazing that we have uh, such a person uh, with us today i'm also ha- I, you know of course and he is a padma shri i'm also very happy to say we have another padma shri joining us today uh, shri arvind gupta so so on this uh, this occasion of national science day it is it is my pleasure to welcome professor pradeep and uh, over to you professor pradeep well it's a great pleasure to be here on this day just one day prior to the national science day to celebrate science and i'm so glad that this is hosted by iit ma my dear organization thank you krishnan thank you nishani thank you papia all of you uh for making this possible the theme as uh, krishnan said is global science for global well being and we celebrate raman and those of you uh, who would like to know more about raman besides all the raman effect and many others raman was excited about mridangam Raman was also excited about Veena, and all those uh, Raman uh, wanted to explore. Uh, that's all there in this uh, great book, Journey into Light. Why are we uh, celebrating global science or this particular theme? Well, science has always been global. Without that global outlook, there is nothing called science. But why? global science for global well being today and that's the theme that i would like to dwell upon in the next uh, few minutes when i heard that the first picture that came to my mind is earthrise earthrise is this most celebrated environmental photograph ever taken by the apollo 8 astronaut william andrus So Andrus took this picture on December 24th 1968 in the background let us say well your Andrus is in sort of a, a satellite and is taking a picture of earth in the background of moon so earth is simply rising so this is this great picture this simply tells you that you have no other place to go other than earth this particular thing is where all our hopes aspirations love hate everything is confined in this space this space is under threat today and that is precisely the point of global science global well being this question of about this particular planet and that is unique planet which is under threat is clear from this picture even more clearer here this is a picture taken by oyager 1 on february 14th 1990 when oyager was sent to explore the solar system it 
Well, it flew and flew and it went past the solar system just after crossing Uranus. It took a picture back. Well, looking at Earth side of the, the sky that you could see. And that is this picture. In that picture, you see a dot and that dot is blue in color. It is blue because of water. And Earth is nothing but water. And one can talk about the threats the water is facing. Obviously, Earth is faced with many other threats today. And this is the reason why, one of the other reasons why we are looking at global science for global well-being. But then when we look at the whole Earth, we should also realize that for human beings, for us, for life, what we talk about Earth is nothing but this distance of about 13 kilometers from the surface that is called, is called the troposphere. This is just about that space that we have and a little down about 10 kilometers down to the ocean. And that is all that thin skin is all that one is, one is looking at. Uh, and that is under threat. Uh, so what is this fundamental issue here? The fundamental issue is the population, as you can see, the global population is, has exploded and has gone to the numbers that we know about. But it has gone to these numbers just in this small period, just about the past 400 years or so. Well, you can see the big changes happening somewhere around 1500. Well, more precisely, the period of science, the period of science, somebody would say, is the period from Galileo, uh, 1589 to 92. Galileo was supposed to have done this uh, experiment of the famous uh, Pisa experiment, tower experiment. And more precisely, somebody has traced it recently to 1591, precisely. This period is the great triumph of science has produced a lot of excitements. And these excitements have enabled us uh, to, to have more food and many others, which I will come to in the course of time. But it has become possible because the global temperature was essentially constant. So if you look at the inset, the global temperature for the past 2,000 years, or if you go down to about 10,000 years, was essentially constant within about plus minus 0.4 degrees. And this enabled us to have agriculture. If the temperature had got fallen down, as in the ice ages, we wouldn't have had agriculture. We wouldn't have had civilizations. We had civilization essentially because we had a constant temperature. Well, the constant temperature, it is, of course, it is changing. As you can see in the past few years, few tens of years, we have increased it enormously. As IPCC says, that is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that the control over carbon emissions by developed countries is probably not the reason for the globe's survival, but the lack of development in less developed countries is. It is that, this is to say that if, the whole world were to produce carbon dioxide like the developed nations do, the world wouldn't be here. The temperature rise would have been, well, uh, something like 60 degrees, 55 degrees. There are many projections uh, that you hear in the literature. Essential point is temperature is changing substantially. Look at just this past uh, 10,000 years, and this is where the temperature is from ice core data. And this is going to take us to nothing but, uh, well, a planet that is unlivable. What are the issues? If I, I think about these issues, the first thing, the first picture that came to my mind is this Borromean diagram. This Borromean diagram is this great picture of, of, of structures. This is three rings together. If you break one ring, the next two rings can be taken apart. The glo global systems are greatly interconnected. If you remove, if you, if you remove, let us say a piece of uh, a glacier, as you see here from Greenland, and it is floating on the ocean, and of course it increases temperature, but the moment, the, ocean, the, the, the 
a piece of glacier comes out, you see reflection is reduced. The amount of light that goes back to the space that reduces. As a result, heat content of the planet increases and it increases melting, uh, ice melting. Of course, sea level rise and biological di biodiversity and a whole lot and a series of things. And at the end, of course, it affects banking. And this is how economy is affected. So there are a whole lot of consequences associated with this. This great interdependence is, is the important reason why we are talking about global science for global well-being. And because of all that, many people think that there are limits to growth. Limits to growth is this famous book. It is now 50 years old. There are three editions of this in different time periods. And the last one in 2003 uh, talked about climate change as a very important threat. In fact, it refers to climate change 23 times uh, in this book. But for us to look at this planet and its population, you one can easily see from a geometric proportion, uh, geometric progression, that 34 generations would, it would take only 34 generations for a person to double, and then, well, one person becomes two, two persons become four, and four becomes eight, and all that. To take this geometric progression, to 10 billion, it would take only 34 generations. But in 34 generations, that means about 80, 850 years, the global population did not become this. Global population became like this because of science, because of many aspects of science. That would tell you that with this growth, we are going to explode and that exponential growth is going to take us far beyond our carrying capacity. As a chemist, I would say that several reactions change the world. The first reaction is photosynthesis, as you see. Understanding of photosynthesis in greater detail made it possible for us to live better. The second reaction, which is the ammonia synthesis, made it possible for us to produce grains. So in India, we are making 220 million tons or more of grains a year. The third reaction is what you see is urea. Right from the time of Oller in 1828, we have been synthesizing many, many molecules, but now we, are, we have made 9 million molecules, 7 million, orga 8 million organic molecules, and 1 million inorganic molecules. We started with one molecule, one chemical synthesis, and that chemical synthesis, of course, today we do it in very differently, not the way that Waller did, but the way that I am writing it here. So this is what is the fertilizer today. Well, the fourth one is our understanding of combustion. This is written in a very simple reaction, but it is now written with diesel and petrol and all that. But combustion in greater detail changed the world and nobody has to tell you that. The fifth, is a polymerization reaction. The polymerization reaction allowed us to, pos it is possible for us today to make polyethylene and because of which we can transport fluids, petroleum, our waste, our water, everything we can transport because we have this great reaction. And I can list out many, many reactions like polymerase chain reactions and the electrochemistry that allowed us to speak today, right? I'm speaking to you because of that. So many, many such things that I've shown you, the pictures of uh, Heber Bosch. So this is the two, two gentlemen who are, who are responsible for the industrialization of the second reaction that I wrote. There are many things that we have done. And we have also made many molecules, which made it possible for us, not just chemical reactions, made it, many molecules made it possible for us to live and change the world. Aspirin changed the world. Urea changed the world. Morphine changed the world. Penicillin changed the world. Vitamin B12 changed the world. Taxol, without Taxol, how can you conquer cancer? And quinine, without this, how can you conquer malaria? Of course, in the process of this understanding, we also produced a number of molecules which destroyed the world. CFCs, which destroy the world, ozone hole, DDT, Agent Orange in, in Vietnam, and endosulfan and thalidomide, and number of things have destroyed the world too. But our synthetic prowess, prowess made it possible for us to make molecules of this kind like vitamin B12 as Woodward did. The picture of Woodward is here. 
So the power of synthetic chemistry has made it possible for us to make almost anything. As today, there are organic chemists who boast of making anything, anything, literally. And this is possible because we have this great universal table for us. This universal table, which was made well, with 63 elements in 1869, which just recently we celebrated 150th year of the periodic table. And that has now become 120 elements with which we can synthesize all our knowledge into something very easily comprehensible. We also, because of all this understanding, we said, uh, Linus Pauling said that molecules are, well, the cause of diseases. And he said this in celebrated paper of, uh, of this paper that you see in 1949. He said sickle cell anemia is a molecular disease. It's a molecular disease. And when diseases are molecules, cure is also a molecule. And just after this came the DNA, which of course changed our understanding. And all of this became possible because we have instrumentation. Today we can manipulate atoms atoms with precision, you see 46 ion atoms arranged in this quantum corral where electrons are, are confined. And all those waves that you see are the electronic electrons oscillations. Today that understanding has gone to cryo-electron microscopy, understanding atoms with extreme precision. And you see at the bottom, it is a set of atoms here, but each one of these atoms is different in chemical, you know, the, the, the identity. And one is neodymium, another is manganese. You can identify atoms so that chemical identity can be ascertained uh, with microscopy today. Well, all of these was great, but then today the world is ticking because of internet. It is, Vishen was telling me that I won a prize. Along with me, another set of people won this prize for internet, you see? Internet transformed the world and, and COVID-19, the world ticked just because of this. And the world is nothing but an extremely, you know, a, a, a finite thing that you can touch and feel today. But what has happened also is that science has become highly interdisciplinary. On the one side, it is, it is this DNA and architecture of that kind. The other day, the other uh, end is it's transforming into medicines and it is into production. Nature and engineering and everything else is sort of put together. It is the same branch of science uh, today. But you know, I just gave you this brief tour of this science, the way it is expanding today to tell you that the world is, although it has expanded tremendously, we have done a very big mistake. The big mistake that we have done is we have opened a very important cycle, which was quite confined in the past several years, we opened that cycle. So this is that simple cycle. If you look at the life outside, the green life that you see is photosynthesis. So this allowed us to make food. It is carbon plus carbon, water plus carbon dioxide is sugar plus oxygen. That is that cycle. That is that one side, which is outside. The other side is us. We make this, we take this sugar and oxygen and make it to water and carbon dioxide. But it's not that plants make only sugar and oxygen. They make alkaloids and terpenes and many others. Just as we also burn many others, not just carbon dioxide is the only thing that we produce. We also produce nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide and many others. But the key point is for this whole process for us to live, we would have emitted just about 29 billion tons of CO2, but we are now producing 258 billion tons of CO2, 10 times more. And this is what is changing the world in, in an unprecedented fashion. This is nothing but our restriction, our, our, our growth is in a confined space. And if we don't restrict ourselves in a confined space, we will cross certain boundaries. This is eminently captured in this picture of planetary boundaries. The planet itself has, well, in certain concentrations of species and all that, we have limited, we have a boundary that is represented in this green circle. 
we have crossed that green circle. Even in 1950, we crossed in one axis. 1970, 1990, we have crossed in several axes. Today, we have crossed in four different dimensions, these planetary boundaries. What are those? Well, biogeochemical cycles, uh, biosphere integrity, etc. Most important point is that some time ago, if you look at here, this is stratospheric ozone depletion. In 1990, we had crossed it, but with science, with precise control of science, CFC's emissions, we brought it back to the limits. The point that I wanted to say is that by understanding what the process is, by implementing machinery or mechanisms, we could bring back the planet into the planetary boundaries. Today, it is a time to do that uh, with science. But it is also important to realize that biological complexity always is built with a few elements. The entire biological processes that we have, we do this mostly with five elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, and phosphorus, and a few things like that. Is it possible for us to build the complexity of the world that we are living in with elements that are sustainable? For example, is it possible for us to build new batteries with these elements? Is it possible to build tough and strong materials with these elements? Is it possible to build the world with biological elements, elements of biological relevance? It is this thought with which we started looking at water. So here is a product that we have in the field. You will hear about it more in a video. What we have done are materials available in the, on the planet, modified them suitably, and we remove arsenic and uranium and many others from water. This blue thing is a water purifier. It has now, uh, well, gone everywhere. It is now supplying water to about 1.3 million people. Well, arsenic-free water. There are many other different kinds of water that we supply, uh, well, to a greater extent. The science, I don't have time to talk about that science, but that science is, of course, equally rewarding too. So we create porous materials and we filter water through that. And we study this in the laboratory. We produce PhDs uh, in the course of uh, this work. And this has been put in the form of uh, purifiers like these or a community purifiers of this kind across the country. But what is that we can do now? Well, you look at this chemical reaction I told you. We opened the cycle, I said. Is it possible that the CO2 that you have produced, can you make that to C1, which is methane, or CN, which may be hexane or heptane or whatever? And can you make this to CO2 again? Of course, we will, we will run the cycle. So ultimately, there will be net, no net carbon emission. Can we drive this with atmospheric, uh, the sunlight? So CO2 to C1, can you, or CN, can you make it with sunlight? Our people have done that in this country. Today, it is possible for us to make CO2 to methanol 2,000 kilograms a day. Can we do that at the cost that is affordable? Is it possible to make it at 36 rupees so that methanol is commercial methanol can be made? Is it possible to make ethanol or is it possible for us to make hexane? This is a very important step forward. Well, I should tell you that our dreams come to reality with materials. Some years ago, this great person called Jules Verne wrote a book, 1865. He wrote about sending a man to moon and he used a material. That material is aluminum. With aluminum, he could send a man, well, he thought about sending a man to moon. Aluminum had not been commercially made in 1865. Aluminum's commercial production started only in 1878. He dreamt about it. Is it possible for us to dream about water? From water, we make hydrogen. 
and burn it and make high water again. And in the process, drive the world. And in that process, we will make both energy and water simultaneously. We started with water, we ended up with water. Is it possible to think about new science? It is happening today. Today's spectrometers are as small as this. This four millimeter spectrometers are available today. Is it possible to put these spectrometers into your, your mobile phones? Two millimeter spectrometers are coming today or tomorrow. With that, we will be detecting water quality, air quality, and many others uh, in the course of time. We are really sensing uh, biology with small devices of this kind, already they have come uh, to the marketplace. In the laboratory, we detect contaminants even at one parts per billion with miniature devices of this kind. This is actually a video I don't have time uh, to tell you. But the key to this is that we have advanced materials. We can develop them in the form of uh, electrodes with which even one parts per billion arsenic can be measured in the field without going anywhere else, not with pre-concentration, directly measuring water quality in the field. How can this be applied across the world? This is the process that we are in, and this is what IIT Ma and others should do. Well, world is changing also with synthetic food. This is food, the biscuit that we are making in the laboratory today. In the laboratory today with CO2, the air that we are breathing out, is it possible that this be possible? Well, it can also be not just uh, organic food of this kind, but also meat of this kind is possible, others have shown. Now, this is a piece of food that you can get if you come to my laboratory. My science is done with students. Of course, grant fantastic colleagues of this kind. We have built companies. A lot many have been involved in developing the science to people, a great institution, which you are all part of. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic uh, talk there, Professor. I mean, I was furiously taking down a lot of notes. <laughs> and a lot of takeaways for us to go and uh, and study tomorrow. But thank you for this very uh, provoking, thought-provoking talk that you gave. Uh, you know, I have one request to the people. I, I will request you to start typing in your questions in the chat box uh, so that we so that we can have the you know Professor Pradeep and uh, you know address them. But before we get to the Q and A. Uh, we also have one uh, one very interesting. Professor Pradeep talked about a video that uh, that is going to be launched. So here I will uh, I have the the pleasure of inviting uh, uh, Sri Arvind Gupta, uh, you know, to say a few words and then launch that video. Now Sri Arvind Gupta is a Padma Shri. He is a he is an author, translator, scientist, and of course very well known. For his, uh, you know, as the as the, the the toy inventor and done a lot of interesting work with uh, with school children. So, over to you, uh, uh, Mr. Arvind Gupta. <coughs> Mr. Krishnan, I hope you can hear me very clearly. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this occasion. Uh, I was in Chennai. I've been aware about uh, Professor Pradeep's work for a very long time, especially his work on on water and. Uh, I, I feel myself very unfortunate that I spent three years in Chennai. I went to IIT Madras a couple of times, but was uh, were not able to meet him. Uh, but this is a good occasion. Uh, it's a splendid address, uh, very brief, very concise, but very focused. I just recall my days, uh, 1970, I entered IIT Kanpur, and there was a political slogan at that time. Hmm? Go to the people, live with them love them, start from what they know, build on what they have. Now, this is the kind of work which I see a reflection of in Professor Pradeep's work. And there are many ivory tower scientists who write you know, mammoth papers and which gather dust. But really solving the people's problems, arsenic we know is a poison and it, it, it affects the health of millions of people. And with very simple, very frugal technologies, 
try to help millions of people to drink clean water at a very, very fraction of the commercial. I think I salute him uh, for his work. And uh, it's my absolute honor to release this video. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll request the team to play the video now, please. You know. the state of Punjab. We took a drive right into its heart and soul, deep into the interior villages. We were dumbstruck by the beauty of the green fields. All through our journey, we had noticed several blue-colored equipment in white cages right below water tanks. We explored. We learned that these are community water purifiers installed at 97 locations across Punjab in capacities ranging from 25 KLD to 1000 KLD. Based on state-of-the-art nanotechnology, it removes iron and arsenic from water without electricity. It delivers pure water conforming to all quality standards at an insignificant cost of 2.5 paise per litre. We tasted this water and let me tell you, it tasted so pure. This water purifier, incidentally, is called Amrit, meaning nectar in English. The groundwater in the state of Punjab is highly contaminated with iron and the deadly arsenic. Exposure to arsenic from drinking water causes heart diseases, diabetes and may even cause death by cancer. <laughs> Obviously, nectar is indeed sweet. We resumed our journey traveling through rugged roads. मेरे स्कूल के साथ ही वाटर सप्लाई की टैंकी है। इससे पहले जब जे प्यूरिफिकेशन नहीं लगा था, तो बहुत बच्चे बीमार होते थे। बच्चे वाटर बोटल घर से लेकर आते थे। There are no diseases at all and सारे बहुत ही वधिया ने उन वाटर बोटल्स दी भी कोई जरूरत नहीं पहरी। अठवें दिक्कत पानी होंगा बहुत वधिया पानी। डंगर भी पीन देने, पंदे पीन देने, जानवर भी पीन देने बहुत वधिया सोसरा पानी जानदा। तो सारे बच्चे और हम स्टाफ भी खुद भी वही पानी पी रहे हैं और वो पानी काफी अच्छा है। अपने घर के लिए लेकर जा रहा हूँ। वो उसे पाइपलाइन बची हुई है कि पानी आ रहा है। अहिर पोड़ भी काली बहुत। ये दो टाइम लेकर जाते हैं। People were emotional when they spoke about how these water purification plants had brought in drastic improvement in their lives and health. मैं तो ये कोई कुछ मांग सकनी हूँ। हाँ जी। अगर किसी दिन तो सी इस प्रोफेसर को दीप जी में मिलो, उन्हानु क्या ना मैंने उन्हें बहुत बहुत असीसा देनी है। इस सौ साल जीन, उन्हाने वैसे भी अपने अगले दस जन्मा वसे बत्तेरिया असीसा ते नहीं किया जमा कर लेती हैं। Oh my God. The periodic water quality test reports showed us that the amount of arsenic in water is untraceable. It exceeded WHO specifications. The plants are cleaned once every 15 days through a process called backwash. When the nanomaterials which absorb the impurities reach saturation capacity, the active materials are replaced. They are safely discharged and the state has arranged for this. Our joy at encountering a mountainous stretch on the way to Ropa forced us to halt for a cup of hot spicy tea. Surprise! We saw the familiar water tank at the top of the tallest hillock in the area. We were inquisitive. <laughs> We then visited the largest plant in operation so far at a village called Chaudhriwala. Here was a 1000 KLD plant delivering clean water to about 650 households to almost 4000 people, 70 litres per day per person. We were impressed. 
This set us thinking if over 97 plants could be integrated along with water supply schemes, the government must be hyperactive too. We reached Chandigarh to talk to them. I am very very thankful to the IIT Madras whereby they have provided a technological solution where the heavy metals like iron, like arsenic and others can be removed from the drinking water. What was good was that the IIT was also willing to work with us on changing the prototype that we had. And they came out with a prototype of what is called the household uh, arsenic and iron removal purifiers. Technology was based upon the nanomaterial and it was a highly efficient technology which is adsorption based uh, nanomaterials are used for cleaning the water. So intangible benefit of these things in the terms of health, that's a direct impact uh, as an economic value over the life of the people. These plants are quite compact with high arsenic removal efficiency as nanomaterials provide larger surface area. We understood that the common man-centric government is very proactive and keen to expand on what has already been done. That was enough. 17 days driving. We took a flight to Chennai to further quench our thirst for knowledge. IIT Madras, the best engineering institute in India for seven years in a row, beckons us. The seat of life transforming research as we hang around to meet Professor Pradeep, a Padma Shri awardee. We take a glimpse of his laboratories. Science done here gets transformed to startups and products such as Amrit with the help of IIT Madras Research Park, the first university-owned research park in the country. All of a sudden, someone assured us in. It is now clear that we can address all contaminants of relevance in drinking water affordably and sustainably in India and anywhere else in the world. Although the models shown here are for arsenic and iron, we have similar models available for fluoride, uranium, chromium, mercury and others. As we walk out of Professor Pradeep's office, we are in awe. Science, nanotechnology, infinitely transforming people's lives with water. Fantastic. So that was a, a wonderful uh, video. We got a glimpse of the technology in action. Very nice uh, video, Pro Professor Pradeep. Thank you for uh, choosing this occasion to release it. So we have uh, a few questions. Uh, I just wanted to say that this was done by Suresh Menon. Uh, well, without my intervention, I did not ask him. He, someone told him that this is doing great job. So let he volunteered. Let me go to the field. Uh, and uh, he made this uh, all by himself. Yeah. Fantastic. And in a way, it's a, it's a great, uh, this thing saying, uh, you know, global science for uh, global well-being. Because the, uh, it, is, it is phenomenal science. But at the end of the day, the impact is also being seen in the in the lives of these people. So it's a great example. We do have a few questions here, Professor Pradeep. Maybe I can, uh, you know, I can ask some of them, and you can share your thoughts. Meanwhile, I'll request the others also to uh, to type in. So the first question is from Karan uh, Bhanushali. How practical, impactful, and sustainable are circular economy models in overcoming current capitalism favored? Uh, non-eco-friendly ways? Well, very complex question. Uh, I can only touch upon uh, the tip of that iceberg. Um, uh, there are several uh, materials-based solutions um, that can be used for um, 
the kind of things that I just told you about methanol or uh, things of this kind. But then uh, as uh, Mr. Nair was asking, well, in another uh, message here, we are at, at that kind of a scale of a few tons, but the world wants millions of tons. And today that scale has not been reached. The materials themselves that are, that are used uh, in this uh, production of methanol, for example, in the course of their production, they produce CO2. So if you ask the question, the total CO2, there are interesting, well, issues that need to be addressed. And they use materials, not sustainable materials. They use precious metals and many others. So the whole complex circularity uh, is, has still not been addressed. And if at all that's addressed, it is not addressed at scale. There are a whole lot more to be done. So I, I just leave it there. We have more things to uh, talk about. And if you have more specific other subjects, such as food, for example, ammonia, for example, we can discuss this. Sure. Uh, then we have uh, Murli. In fact, Murli is uh, uh, one of our members of the Thought Leadership Council. And uh, so he is asking what, you know, he's saying what is happening is clear, but what is not clear is what is not happening. Is it because of science or is it because of our human greed? All of us know about global warming, but why are we not coming together to solve this? Yes, there are a whole lot of complex issues. Uh, about 20 years ago, when I was uh, just getting started with my water activities, uh, somebody uh, drove me, well, a two-wheeler and a four-wheeler, uh, which was powered by hydrogen. We did not push enough. The technology was available even then. We did not push enough because the hydrogen was a competitor for, for internal combustion engines of the traditional kind. So there are several competing factors which are limiting our technological growth. I just want to touch upon just that much to say that we may have technologies, but they may not see light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Now, incidentally, uh, if I can add one thing, uh, Murli, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm now sort of uh, learning something by, uh, by this uh, famous physicist, Fritjof Capra, called the systems view of life. And, and in some sense, the, the fact that we don't have the systems view of life, but a very reductionist view of life, in some ways is perhaps responsible for that, uh, for the state of things. So, uh, it's not great... built uh, right from, uh, well, so you talked about systems approach. <laughs> systems approach have, uh, must start right from the score. Right. So the next question, I think you touched upon it, is by Mr. Nair, who once again is a member of our uh, uh, Thought Leadership Council. In fact, he is, he is part of the second, the very second batch of uh, IIT Madras. Uh, so he says, uh, as a power engineer, I'm quite interested on the topic of recycling of CO2 into useful products, including food, with an economically viable process. How many years will it take to reach commercial scale? Methanol has reached that scale, but uh, it has not reached from 42 rupees to 36 rupees. That's a big uh, challenge, but at the same time, that is not circular completely. Uh, and I, I touched upon that in the beginning. Food, it takes, it will take another probably five, six more years to really start seeing some products, maybe 10 years to start seeing something commercial uh, in, in that space. Uh, but that food is done not going to be the variety food. It's going to be food that is edible for of certain kind, uh, only certain varieties. Uh, but then there is, uh, of course, you can think about clothing, you can type out new fibers, you can talk about new polymers. So in several of these areas, uh, scale, CO2 to scale, products at scale is going to be a challenge. Ultimately, there is nothing that is limiting from converting CO2 to a fiber. Right. So the next uh, question is from Mridula Nair. Mridula is once again a member of our uh, Thought Leadership Council. Uh, she is in New York. Um, uh, inspiring talk, Professor Pradeep. Can you can you comment on the energy usage for this water purification process? 
So we analyze this from uh, a number of sustainability parameters. So you ask the question, how much of energy per, uh, let us say, per kiloliters of water? Uh, how much of carbon emission? How much of water that is consumed? So all of these uh, sustainability parameters, it essentially finally boils down to an ecological factor. We have shown that these materials are far, far better than what is available today. But that is still not to say that that is, these are like uh, biology. Uh, still there are, there is some amount of water to be precise here, one liter of water used for the production of these materials produce about thousand liters of water, clean water. So in terms of, let us say water positive index, we are at 10 power three, but biology, is it a 10 power three? Can we get even better? So those are interesting questions. Uh, we have still not reached there, but I think, with available knowledge today, we are doing the best. Right. So the next question is from uh, Bridge Mohan. Uh, he's asking, are you also working on low cost water purifiers? Uh, you know, like, like, like some of the popular brands that we have at home, are you working on such uh, low cost water purifiers? Uh, no, our address, uh, Bridge Mohan, our focus was where there is no real solution, like arsenic has been, people are suffering because affordable, sustainable solutions are not there for government to implement. So we essentially focused on that segment, but then it so happened that government was not in a position to supply piped water, piped water connection to a number of places. So they asked for, can you address at least those unconnected people with a home purifier, we delivered that. Uh, and that is probably not the model, I think, because ultimately this has to be individual, has to be responsible, in that individual has to take care of the maintenance. This is not sustainable in our villages uh, because there are, of course, materials have to be delivered, etc. So that is where the community purifiers are the uh, solutions for this. Uh, but then it is not possible in several parts of the country, especially, let us say, remote habitations, 50, 60 people live there on top of a hillock. Uh, what do you do? So those are the places that we have supplied. But by and large, all those that you've heard about, uh, we have reached about 12 million people so far. Everything is uh, in terms of the piped water supply. Great. So the next question is from Ram Nagrani who asks, can you speak on the topic of lab-grown meats? I have eaten uh, lab-grown meat, uh, but it is, to my uh, understanding, it is not at scale uh, today. Uh, now, it is possible in community societies where prices are not really uh, an issue. I do not think that in India, 250 rupees uh, per kg chicken is, is impossible. Uh, that's where the challenge is. And uh, it is that lab made meat is very much possible, but cost is an issue. <laughs> So C. Subramaniam asks, can you, can you share your thoughts and experiences for somebody venturing into deep materials-based technologies? A thought, is there any plans to share your experience in the form of a book? Krishnan Narayanan has to sponsor it. That is when it will become uh, a book, but it is important uh, to write that in the form of a book. Uh, but uh, one quick thing that I would say is that you need to keep at least eight years in your pocket to translate any lab-grown materials technology uh, to product. Krishnan Narayanan would do that in two years, but materials can translate only in that kind of time scale. One. The second thing is that in our, uh, our country, you need to keep publish, 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 
And uh, in the course of publication, a little bit extra will come to you. Use that money to translate. Right, and uh, I think uh, Professor Pradeep himself, I know uh, he, you know, you have started or incubated some six, seven startups yeah. uh, based on this. So I will encourage the uh, the listeners to to go check check out his uh, his website, and there are links to all the that sort of innovative uh, startups coming out. The uh, the next question is from uh, uh, G Madhu. Uh, who asks, do you anticipate any adverse health effects caused by the nanomaterials? That's a serious concern, nanotoxicity. But at the same time, we use materials which are already tested for all these. And even if we have not tested adequately, what I do is I, I, we use only naturally available materials. Uh, so this is the fundamental thing that, that we do. So anything that is used here, uh, the only difference is that it is nanostructured. Otherwise, they are available in nature. Now, with the nanostructuring, will it cause any issue? This is what is addressed, uh, studied in greater detail. Will these materials ever come to your food chain? That is also analyzed in greater detail. Only when these things are satisfactory, they go to uh, go in the form of a product. So I don't anticipate these uh, materials causing an issue. However, nanomaterials in general, toxicity is a concern. So there are global concerns, global committees, uh, global guidelines uh, on these. Uh, Anil Kumar asks, although the cost of water, water purification is really low, uh, but I'm curious if this is a maintenance uh, and installation or the filters have a certain lifespan, where exactly is the biggest barrier to scaling? So this cost that uh, that I was uh, referring to, that is the total cost. Let us say take 10 years of, um, of life of this particular product, the total water that it produces, the amount of money that goes into this, uh, divide that with the liters. So that is the price that you get. Uh, so that price is uh, referring to that. It includes um, capital operation and all that thing, maintenance and everything. Now, what is limiting? Uh, that's a very important question. Even if technologies are affordable and all that, it is not that these technologies reach people uh, because water still is managed by and large by our public health and engineering department. So it has, of course, priorities. This is one important thing. And nation itself doesn't have enough resources to do so. For example, if you have to supply arsenic-free water to everybody, the kind of uh, the money that is needed today is about 15,000 crores. If you don't have that allocation, we don't reach there. And that allocation, efficient allocation. Right. Uh, Professor, you know, I, I myself had one question. That is the, uh, you know, global science or global research. Uh, can you just talk through, like you, you, have, you are doing global research in your, as part of your work. So what are the, what are the challenges uh, that you, know, that you encounter, how can other researchers do global research, et cetera, if you can just touch upon that. Uh, I feel that research is an individual's passion and that personal excellence limits many people from keeping their science for global good. Uh, now, the only way that this can happen for global good is to address those challenges which are of global relevance. That is water or health or environment of things of this kind. So it is important to address such issues right from the beginning. But even then, for example, you are addressing the issue of uh, submergent resistance rise, which is an issue of global food security, sustainability. However, to what extent, how many of us are willing to expose that science for global welfare. This is an institutional problem. This is a patent issues, technology issues, uh, investment in research. All of these are, uh, are limiting us. There is much more to be done in that context to make science affordable, available, equitable for all. Right. Thank you. 
I think, uh, you know, we, uh, we have, you know, maybe just a minute more. Uh, if I can use this opportunity, I mean, I know the, there are members of the Thought Leadership Council on the call today. Uh, if I can request them to, to come in and just state maybe just one thought on this Global Science Day, you know, very briefly, just, just give your, like a one line, uh, you know, this thing, it'll be very nice and we can close, we can close with that, uh, you know, so I'll request, once again, I'm, I'm putting this on, uh, putting this on the, uh, you know, on the spot, but if possible, uh, Mr. Naya, uh, Mridula, Mr. Naya, if you can go next. Yeah, yeah first. Right. One of the main points that I think is important is that the result of all this research work should become available to everybody without a lot of uh, paraphernalia relating to patent protection. Maybe it is required as an extent. So a day has to come when the fruits of research should be available to almost everybody without exorbitant cost of exploitation. Thank you. Uh, Mridula? Mridula, if you're around. Yeah, yeah, I'm around. Yeah, I, I couldn't uh, <laughs> unmute myself earlier, Krishnan. I meant to say hello to you, but I couldn't... Uh... You are, you are sorry, on now. But... You are on now. Please, yeah, please go okay, ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I just want to say, as I mentioned in my write-up, is that uh, I, we are all connected through the waterways and through the air. So I think that the pandemic has just shown us that what happens in a remote corner of the world can impact the entire world. It can affect us in many, many ways. So um, for us to, Christian, you mentioned about the system thinking, you know, and I think it's very important for us to put this in perspective. And we uh, tend to have our little cocoons of patents. I mean, I have a number of patents myself. <coughs> I work for a corporation. We don't share this. Uh, and you notice that with the pharmaceutical companies as well. It, you know, it's very difficult to get these vaccines and everything else across to everybody on the globe. So thinking about global well-being because we are so interconnected and we influence each other in such a great manner, um, unknowingly, unwittingly, uh, it's important for us to share these fundamental findings for the well-being of all human beings. Thank you, Mridula. Uh, Murli? Murli, are you there? T. Murli Dharan. Maybe you should mention the next speaker as well, so that the person. Rakesh, can you unmute, please, if he's there? Thank you. No, who can unmute himself? Okay. Okay, okay. Murli, if you're not, if you're not around, and uh, did I also see Raghu Dharmaraju? Raku. Okay. If yeah, I, maybe they 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 seem to have dropped off, but but uh, you know I thank the uh, the. The, the thought leader council members for sharing their thoughts. Uh, Nishani, I think I think we are at the end of the program. I'll, I'll hand it over back to you then. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. Special thanks to Professor Pradeep. Uh, it was such a wonderful, inspiring talk. And, uh, you know, even though everyone knows about the global challenges we have today, I think you went much deeper into concepts and I think reinforcing the message again and again is what is going to help everybody uh, sort of work their way through uh, environmental challenges and uh, more towards sustainability. It was extremely informative. I think there have been lots of people who requested for your presentation. I request if it's okay with you to please share it with us and we will circulate it to those who have registered and who could make it today and also who could not make it uh, for the program. Thank you. Special thanks to Krishnan uh, for coming up with this idea for this event today and hosting it so well. And of course, to all our Thought Leadership Council members and a special thanks to Dr. Arvind Gupta for joining us here today and uh, sharing some insights with us as well. Uh, thank you to all our alumni members who made it on this Saturday evening or Saturday morning for some. And, uh, you know, if I have missed out on anybody, um, please thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for the team for putting together this. We will be circulating the report and the video with you very soon. 
Thank you, everybody. Have a great 